Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the show that you've been waiting for. It's called Coffee with Scott Adams, and if you'd like to take this experience, which is already practically orgasmic, up to levels that nobody can even understand with the human mind, all you need is a cup or a mug or a glass, a tankard, chalice, or stein, a canteen, jug, or flask, a vessel of any kind. Fill it with your favorite liquid. I like coffee. Join me now for the, unplayer, the unparalleled pleasure, the dopamine, the end of the day, the thing that makes everything better. It's called the simultaneous sip, and it happens now. Ah, oh, so good. Well, I know a number of you who are streaming in. Well, I think I'll wait to make this announcement in a little bit. Uh, but we'll start with this. If you were a uh, subscriber to the Dilbert Reborn comic, either on the Locals platform, scottadams.locals.com, or you could be subscribing on the X platform, um, you would know that I've introduced a new character called uh, Jennifer. Jennifer is her first name. Her last name is Z, C E E. And her friends call her Gen Z. Gen Z. And she's a uh, stereotypical Gen Z. And she's dealing with all the discrimination that people have about the Gen Z workers. So, yeah, Jen will be working on that today. Gen Z, <clears throat> new character. Also, I've, uh, I think I'm going to keep doing this, probably. Um, I'm starting to publish the Dilbert comic only in digital form this year because it's too late to make a paper one because I got canceled and it sort of set me back a little bit. Next year, I'll look into making a paper version. But for now, if you wanted to gift somebody the uh, daily comic... I would recommend that you sign up for the, uh, if it's all you want is the comic, just sign up for the, uh, I'd probably sign up on the X platform, because that would be $3 a month. Because that's, so for you know, $3 times 12, you get the daily Dilbert Reborn that's new every day. But I'm also including one page a day of the Dilbert calendar. And the approach I'm taking is that it'll be the 10 years ago comic. So whatever is today's date, the 10-year-ago matching comic will run on the calendar. And if you wanted to gift it, you could buy yourself a a subscription and then just email it to your spouse or friend or whatever. If they want it in paper, they can print it out. And they would have two comics a day coming to them by email, for example. All right. Um, Also, if you wanted to get a Dilbert mug... They're running out. If you need one for Christmas as a Christmas present, you better hurry because they're always limited uh, production. And if you want one of those, you should go to the X platform and look for Erica at uh, her uh, X profile. is Zia Erica. Z-I-A-E-R-I-C-A. Zia Erica, all one word. And that'll show you where to get the mugs. All right. Um, did you know that there's a professional cuddler? So that's a job. So there's a woman named Ella. She's uh, 48 years old, and she's a single woman. And she will cuddle with you for $150 an hour, non-sexually. Non-sexually cuddling. I would totally pay for that. In case there's anybody who's too embarrassed to say, oh, I'm not such a loser. I'm such a loser. I, I wouldn't. I would admit that I would pay for somebody to hug me. Oh, I would totally pay for it. In terms of things that could make you healthy, you know, the the dollar per value, if you could afford it, I mean, of course, it's like everything. You'd have to be able to afford it. But if you could afford it, I would definitely pay for that. Yep, no doubt about it. I would pay for that service once or twice a week. Um... So that's just so you'll feel less embarrassed if you decide you want to do it. <laughs> you can just say, I'll do it. Just say, well, you know, that cartoonist guy does it. Or I would. All right. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Beast. Do you know Mr. Beast? He's a monster of social media. Has the biggest or one of the biggest social media presences in the world. 
And part of why he's so famous is he does cool things, and people talk about it. And for Halloween, he handed out iPhones. <laughs> Every kid who came to the house got an iPhone. <laughs> now that is amazing. Now he's, he's super, super rich from his um, social media work. So he can give every kid a, an iPhone. I don't know how many he gave out. But one kid, he gave a, a pile of cash. He gave him a $10,000 pile of cash. <laughs> I think it was a little girl. I can't remember if it was a boy or a girl. But there's a video of him just handing... It's, the pile is about, you know, I don't know, it's four inches tall or something. It's just a big pile of cash. <laughs> so the trick-or-treater comes up and he hands her a big pile of cash. And they're like, Really? Can I keep this? Yeah, big pile of cash, $10,000, keep it. It was actually amazing, amazing um, entertainment. So he's very good at what he does, certainly understands the public. Let's talk about uh, Don Jr. Apparently he testified in this case about the property values of the Trump properties and whether they were inflated or deflated or whatever. And uh, he gave this answer. That should have been the only headline. The, the entire story about the Trump people you know, allegedly inflating or deflating their property taxes to get benefits, Don Jr. says, and I'm paraphrasing, my accountant does that. What? Uh, apparently 90% of the public will learn for the first time that the executives don't really make too many accounting decisions on their own. They kind of hire big, expensive accounting firms to do that for them. Now, they might ask some questions, but they're not going to do something illegal because the boss told them to. It doesn't really work that way. <laughs> the big accounting firm, they're not going to take your word for it if it's just crazy. Now, now they do take your word for stuff. That, that's part of what they do. They, they will say, we did not audit you know, the data to see if the data is correct. We're just you know, doing the math on it to pay your taxes. So they do always have an out. But if you, if you told them something that was patently ridiculous, they're not going to just take your word for it. They're going to do a little checking. So I would be amazed if Trump got in trouble for the valuation stuff. I think that just always comes down to there was some accountant who thought it was his best estimate of things, and that's the whole story. Somebody in the accounting world made an estimate. All right. So I expect nothing to come of that. Um, you may know that uh, there was some controversy about uh, windmills off the East Coast killing whales. And I think 75 whales have died recently, washed up. Um, really, really obvious whale death. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Something suddenly was killing whales, and it was the same time as the, the big windmills went in, and there's obvious causation, you know, the humming disorients them or something. So um, you may know that the, the same Erica, I mentioned with the mugs, uh, had been advocating to uh, end the, at least the new build, builds, and Michael Schellenberger was part of that. And it looks like they got some victory here. Um, so the Orsted company that was, uh, they abandoned the projects they had planned to build off the coast of New Jersey. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't help the ones that are already there, I guess, right? So the windmills that already exist are probably still going to kill whales. It might be more to go. More to do on that, but uh, at least there was enough pressure to stop uh, a, new, a new project from killing more whales. So advocacy works. Look at that. Good job, Erica. Save some whales. All right, uh, ABC News Australia had uh, this weird headline. Uh, a year after Elon Musk bought Twitter, X is now a, quote, worthless platform some say is no longer safe for activists. Really? <laughs> really? It's a worthless platform that activists can't use? What, what would make it less useful for activists. Well, what would that be? Would it be violence? No, no. Twitter doesn't cause any violence because of the change of ownership. 
No. Is it uh, because if you're an activist, you're not allowed to have an account? No. No, you're allowed to have an account. So you're allowed to have an account. Oh, oh, I know what it is. It's that Twitter has algorithms that suppress certain people if they don't like their opinions, right? Oh, no, it's not that, because that's what Elon Musk got rid of. He got rid of the fake algorithms. So let's see. They can sign up. They can say anything they want, just like everybody else. What makes it worthless? Oh, could it be that community notes are attached to things that are obvious bullshit and that much of activism is just obvious bullshit? Could it be that now that the conservatives are now suppressed, that when somebody says something that's terrible bullshit, there's a lot more people saying that's terrible bullshit because they're not suppressed? Could it be that freedom of speech doesn't work if your idea is batshit fucking crazy? Doesn't work as well, does it? That whole freedom of speech is really fucking you up, isn't it? Sorry. (laughs) If you ever thought that ABC News was like a legitimate news entity, nope. Definitely not a legitimate news entity. They are just activists who are mad that they can't control the world. All right, I would like to give you now the reframe of reframes. I call it the alpha reframe. I'm going to give you a reframe that for some of you, I like to do this, it's like, you know, for some of you, this will be completely life-altering. I'm simply going to tell you something, just a few sentences, that for some of you will completely change your life in a positive way. You ready for this? Here's the ultimate reframe. The usual reframe goes like this, and I think a lot of you are in this category. I have trouble sleeping. How many of you would say that's true of yourself? I have trouble sleeping. Pretty much everybody, right? All right, here's the reframe. Instead of saying, I have trouble sleeping, say, I don't exercise enough. Now, I already told you about this one, but I'm going to extend it. That's what makes it the alpha reframe. If you exercise enough, will you sleep better? Not 100% of the time, but pretty close. My own experience is that when I exercise enough, I always sleep. And when I don't, I almost can't. No matter what else happened, doesn't matter if my day was good or bad or what tomorrow looks like, nothing. If I exercised, I go to sleep. Now, that's not enough. I haven't stopped there. If you exercise enough, you're going to get enough sleep. If you get enough sleep, and I call this, by the way, you've heard of twofers? A twofer is where you get two benefits. Well, if you exercise in order to fix your sleep... That's two benefits. you got to exercise because you had another reason to do it. Oh, I'm not exercising just to be uh, handsome or good-looking or healthy. I'm also fixing my biggest problem is I can't get to sleep. That's a twofer. This is a sixfer. Six benefits. You ready? (laughs) Exercise helps you sleep. What does sleep help you do? It improves your diet. Did you know that? Sleep improves your diet. If you're tired, your body will register hunger that's not a genuine hunger. It's just one of those feelings that have a crossover. Yeah, it's like thirst. Sometimes you think you're tired, but you're really thirsty because you're dehydrated. Some of these things are tricky. The thing you feel isn't necessarily the thing that's going on. So you fix your exercise to fix your sleep. Your sleep fixes your diet Your sleep fixes your mental health. Your sleep fixes your relationships. Your sleep fixes your performance at work and therefore your potential in your career. (laughs) Exercise, sleep, diet, mental health, relationships, work performance, six fucking benefits from exercise. It's a six for. (laughs) So the next time you say you can't sleep... Tell yourself, God damn it, I'm going to exercise tomorrow. You can even use that. <laughs> you should swear at yourself. You should get mad at yourself. You should say, God damn it, I'm an asshole. I need to, I need to exercise tomorrow. And when I say exercise, I mean a long walk. Right? You don't need to hit the weights. I like weights. I, I highly recommend 
doing at least lightweight training at every age. But just take a walk, right? No, there's nothing stopping you from standing up and walking out the door and walking around the block, unless you live in a dangerous neighborhood like San Francisco. All right, so that's your alpha reframe. It's a six for. There's a uh, painting that just sold at an auction in New York for $46.5 million. Uh, the top of the painting is yellow and the bottom is blue, and that's it. That's it. I think it maybe is suggestive of the Ukraine flag or something, but I don't know. Has anybody ever heard of this guy, Mark Rothko? Do you think you could have made a painting that was just yellow at the top and blue at the bottom, and, and that's it? No? Well, uh, apparently Elon Musk said the other day, it might have been on Joe Rogan, uh, a number of these very high-priced art things are tax evasion and money laundering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're telling me that Hunter Biden, after all that pressure for being the you know, the, the, the sketchy money guy goes directly into the business that is the most obvious money laundering business in the history of the world. The most directly, obviously bullshit thing. Now I ask again, have you seen a video of Hunter Biden making one of his paintings? And I'm not, I'm not talking about the one where he's blowing paint through a straw. Okay, because I do believe he can blow paint through a straw. But he also have paintings that look like they're a very high-level, skilled person made them. Wouldn't you love to see about 10 minutes of Hunter Biden making a painting? Wouldn't you? (laughs) Now, I don't think there's any uh, law that would force him to show you that he paints them himself. I don't think you can force anybody to do that. So it is kind of the perfect public crime. It's one of the few crimes you can just do right in front of everybody. It's like, hey, everybody, I'm selling a painting. It's a pretty good business to get into until they catch you, put you in jail. All right. Um, does, anybody, does anybody think there's any chance that Hunter is just a legitimate artist selling paintings? Nobody thinks that's real, right? But isn't it amazing that even though we know it's not real, it makes no difference in the real world. Hunter will just do it right in front of you. Yeah. So, there's that. All right, here's a story that uh, really tore me up this morning. Let's see if I can get through this. So it turns out that uh, Run DMC... um, which one was it? Run? <laughs> I, I get them confused, but I think it was Run. Run. Which, which, which artist was it? The one who has the... Uh, well, one of them had spas- spasmodic dysphonia. And that's the voice problem that made him so sad because he couldn't rap because he had the same voice problem I used to have. It's the same one that uh, RFK Jr. has, where the vocal cords clench. And he talks about how he tried to get treatment using Botox shots, but he passed out during the Botox shot. Now, if I've never described to you what the Botox into the vocal cords process looks like, I'm just going to say it's the scariest, thickest needle you've ever seen in your life, and it goes through the front of your throat. And it doesn't stay there. It penetrates the entire front to get to the back because that's where your vocal cords are. The first needle is just to numb you so you don't scream when the second one goes in. Does it hurt? Well, you'll feel a needle in your throat poking around. It doesn't know exactly where to poke because everybody's vocal cords are a little different. So there's a little bit of you know technique about it. When you get that shot, if it works, it only works for a few weeks. It sort of numbs your vocal cords so they have a hard time clenching. But you would talk sort of like this. You, you talk sort of like, sort of like you'd, done, you'd uh, take gas from a balloon or something. So, so if you're a public performer, there isn't any really way you could be a rapper. You could be understood, but your, your voice would be like this forever. 
And that would only be good for a few weeks, if you're lucky, and then the Botox starts wearing off. <clears throat> so you have to time it so when you get the new shot, it hasn't doubled the amount of Botox because you got it too soon. So, so you never know quite how much poison you have in your vocal cords because it's sort of a judgment, trial and error kind of thing. And each trial and error involves a giant needle through your neck. Uh, I've done it. So I'm not talking hypothetically. I've had, had this procedure. Um, <clears throat> apparently, the rapper just passed out cold. Like that. The, this is the scariest shit you've ever seen in your life, honestly. I've never done anything scarier. Uh, and after a few treatments of it, I think I did three, maybe, I said, uh, no, thank you. I will live with my disability, and I'll try to figure out something else. Eventually, through my... Um, let's say, tenaciousness, and the fact that I'm a... Uh, there's no way to say this other than to just say it directly. I'm a high-functioning individual in a modern society. So I was able to chase to ground a cure, which was very hard to find, and I had to like travel. I mean, I had to search the world. I had to use every Google alert. Every time there was a suggestion of a cure, I would track it down. Right? So I was a wild man. Do you know why I was such a wild man? Do you know why I said, I will stop at nothing to fix this problem? Because I was suicidal. I was 100% suicidal. The only reason I didn't is because other people depended on me. But my own life was garbage. The quality of life was way below the line of being worth living. It wasn't even close. There was, there was no way to have joy or a good day. Every day you woke up was a bad day because you were like a ghost in the world. You couldn't have conversations. You couldn't, you couldn't nourish your relationships. You couldn't make a phone call. Couldn't answer the phone. Couldn't order at a restaurant. Just imagine what that would be like. All right. So, uh, and apparently the rapper from Run DMC... Uh, was suicidal, and he ended up um, with a, an addiction problem as well, and etc. Now, I think he still has the condition, as far as I know. Uh, but why did he not get the surgical cure? Do you know why he didn't get the surgical cure? Anybody want to take a guess? Well, why don't you take a Google search for spasmodic dysphonia and then see what Google tells you are the treatments. It's going to tell you Botox and also Botox and also Botox. Do you think it will refer you to the surgeons who can cure it? Check for yourself. See for yourself. Now, here are the things you know. These are the things you know for sure. Oh, and I can tell you this for sure. After I got cured, and I realized that the reason other people were not being cured is that they simply didn't know there was a solution. So I did a fairly aggressive public relations thing. There was a big spread on me in People magazine, how I cured my voice problem. And, you know, I, I did other interviews, and I talked about it on social media. And I just wanted to create a base so that if anybody ever Googled spasmodic dysphonia, I would be the first person to come up. And then they would see my story, and then they would know there's a cure. Do you know where my story is now? After I got canceled? It's gone. I don't think you could find it too easily. Now, what about the surgery itself? Because, you know, I'm not the only person who got it. I'm not the only person who knows about it. In fact, the, the person who did my surgery sits on the board of directors of the Spasmodic Dysphonia Foundation or whatever it's called, the organization, right? Go Google it. Now, here's, here's what we know for sure. There, is a lot, there are tens of thousands of people in the United States who have a spasmodic dysphonia. We know that for sure. We also know for sure that it causes you to have suicidal ideation. I've been in groups of spasmodic dysphonia people. They'll all tell you the same thing. Yeah, I considered it. Why don't they do it? Always the same reason. 
other people. They, they have some responsibilities, so they're hanging around. That's it. If you gave them a choice of, is this worth living, quite a few of them would say, you know, honestly, it's not. I only do it for these other people. Now, how many people do you think didn't have anybody that they needed to support enough that it stopped them? Probably, there's no way to know for sure, probably there are people who could have been cured by surgery who fucking killed themselves. Because the Google search did what it did. Did it do it by accident? Do you think the Google search is the way it is by accident? Nope. Probably not. No way to know. Um, uh, so I can't, I can't make it a certain allegation. It just seems to me that when you fuck with the truth, people die. And this looks like a real clear example of somebody. I, I'm not even going to say who. I don't know who. But it looks like somebody fucked with the truth. And I'll guarantee you, Somebody died. Yeah, your algorithm can kill you if they hide the truth. Now, do you think that Run DMC, even today, do you think he knows that there's a surgical cure? Probably not. Probably not. Because he can't Google it. All right. <clears throat> and did canceling me get somebody killed? Possibly. Canceling me might have killed people because they couldn't Google me anymore. <laughs> Here's a clever little thing, changing the topic a little bit. Um, anyway, that, that just tore me up this morning. But anyway, um, you know how this Sphinx is kind of a mystery, how it got built, and it looks like it's been eroded by wind or water or something, and we always talk about it. It turns out there's a new hypothesis that looks really strong. And I feel, I feel bad for the Egyptians because their, uh, let's say their reputation keeps like going down. You remember when you thought the ancient Egyptians built the pyramids? For sure. So ancient Egyptians, awesome. And then people start saying, oh, I'm not so sure. I don't know if it was the ancient Egyptians. I'm like, really? Give them something, right? Yeah, give those ancient Egyptians a, a little bit of credit. You know, maybe they did. But, you know, they, there are lots of uh, YouTube videos supposing something magical happened. Uh, but now the Sphinx, another big sort of e Egyptian success story, I guess. Um, they did a test, and they found out that the Sphinx can be formed, like 90% of its shape can be formed by the wind. That's right. If you, if you have a desert where there's some hard parts, you know, there's something that's harder than something else, then if the wind is blowing past it, the, the sand will blow away, but the, you know, the stiffer, hardened parts would remain behind. And they did tests, and they found out that it, it often looks like a sphinx. <laughs> if, you just, if you just have hard parts and soft parts and blow on them, they turn into a sphinx. And by that, I mean the body is just sort of a, a rounded rectangle. And sometimes there would be something that looks like a head just because there might be a hardened thing that happened to be in that position. So the speculation is that the ancient Egyptians discovered it and said, hey, look at that thing. It, if you sort of squint at it, it looks like an animal you know, on its haunches or whatever that is. And then they said, I got an idea. Let's like put a nose on it and you know, build it down a little bit, make it, make it look like a lion. So it's possible that it was a natural, uh, at least the, the interior of it was natural, and then they sort of coated it and carved it up a little bit and turned it into a sphinx. Apparently there are some other examples of it around the world. So. Anyway, I don't know if that's true, but it's fun. Well, I guess Biden was giving a fundraiser talk and it was some uh, crazed protester uh, yelling at him, and then he made the following claims in public. He said he convinced uh, Bibi, that would be Netanyahu to you, to call for a ceasefire, 
which apparently never happened. And he talked to Sisi, which I guess is the Egyptian leader, to convince him to open the door, which also never happened. <laughs> now, that's the reporting. I, I, can't, I can't be sure they never talked or that he never said these things, but it's reported that he made two claims which are like wildly important. He just lied, just made it up. Now I don't know. I don't know what the truth is there, but that's that's the allegation. Uh, apparently, <laughs> they sent Kamala Harris out in, in the aftermath of the October seventh slaughter in Israel. You know the most worst terrorism. You know, really, I've ever heard of. I've never heard of anything worse than that, honestly. Uh, so they send Kamala Harris out in that context to. Uh, try to convince people to reduce their Islamophobia. So she thinks uh, too much Islamophobia, and that's her, that's her message. She wants, to, she wants to get out the word that uh, there's too much Islamophobia. Now, how, how do you interpret this? How could she accidentally read the room that wrong? I mean, talk about the wrong reading of the room. I mean, if she'd gone out and said, you know, we don't want any discrimination in any direction, and then called out anti-Jewish discrimination as well as anti-Islamic discrimination, I would say, good job. That's what I would say. I would say, good job. That's about what we need. We we need a a leader who goes out there and says, hey, stop hating each other for these reasons. That'd be great. But no, she decided to go uh, full... uh, i uh, got to counter this Islamophobia. And it makes me wonder, was this a prank? Do, do you think there was any point where they said, all right, for sure we don't want her as our future president. What could we do today to reduce the chance she could ever be a president? Hey, I've got an idea. What is it? Let's send her out right after October 7th to say there's too much Islamophobia. And then also the anti-Semitism, right? No, this is the beauty of it. Not even going to mention. Not even going to mention the anti-Semitism. What? That would be, like, insane. I know! That's the whole point. Oh, I get it now. We're going to send her out and see if she's dumb enough to go full, you know, countering anti... You know, countering Islamophobia, which is good. And we're just going to leave out the other part right after October 7th. Exactly. And that will guarantee she's never president. And I think it worked. It did guarantee that she'll never be president. Um, So, well... Do you think Kamala Harris uh, has been a big move forward for uh, black women or women? I feel like she's doing such a bad job that it's hard not to think she's a minority, you know, diversity hire. Like, she looks like the, the prototypical diversity hire mistake, you know, where you overcorrect it. It's like, okay, we like diversity. That's great. But you may have overcorrected in this case. It may be the most prominent diversity hire mistake of all time. Well, I guess it is, wouldn't you say? I would argue that a lot of people would say Obama did a good job. I know, I know, my audience doesn't like to hear that. But a lot of people would say that. How many people are saying that Kamala Harris is nailing it? No serious person. There's no serious person who thinks she's doing a good job. So that's a step backwards for uh, black people, black women, women, pretty much everybody. But women are doing great in MBA uh, classes. Now, women make up um, half or more of MBA classes. I guess since the 80s, women have been getting into college and graduating at higher rates than men. So women are uh, doing great, education-wise, thanks to tremendous effort on top of the uh, MBA schools to make sure that white men don't get uh, a a fair shake in America. That's just another way to tell the story. Both true, both true, that the colleges are doing a great job 
increasing diversity, especially for women. 100%. Good job. Also, doing a great job of making this a shitty country for white men, uh, reducing their chances of success. Great job on that, too. Here's a question that David Boxenhorn on the X platform asked, and I don't know if there is an answer to this, but if, you, if you've heard of anything like this, let me know. David asks, uh, and he says, I've asked this twice on the X platform without getting an answer. I'll ask it a third time. Has any important Muslim religious leader, you know, keyword religious leader, condemned the Hamas attack as being un- un-Islamic? Condemn it for being un-Islamic. Have they? It's a good question, isn't it? So, how are you going to fight Islamophobia if you don't have any important Muslim religious leaders condemning the Hamas attack as being un-Islamic? If the religious leaders think it's Islamic then Islamophobia makes perfect sense. It it would be crazy not to be Islamophobic if they don't condemn it. In fact, it's almost almost an invitation to be their enemy. Right? I I would say it's an invitation to hate. Now, but, but let me just say, I would condemn Islamophobia in general. Like, I don't think there's any... There's no good reason to just hate somebody because of their religion. But if their religion includes some code that says it's okay to do what happened on October 7th, well, then I would say it's perfectly good to discriminate like crazy. Because that would be self-defense. Now, I've said this before. um, Discrimination, bigotry, has no place when it comes to, you know, hiring renting a place, selling a home, having a personal relationship, who you marry, you know, where your kids go to school, like all the normal things of society, no discrimination should be tolerated for these reasons, you know, race, religion, any of that stuff, gender. So I think we're all on that same page. However, in the context of self-defense, you can do anything you want. And if that requires you to be Islamophobic to survive, go do that for self-defense. Yeah. So nobody's ever countered me on this point, that discrimination in normal civil society, completely unwelcome and dis- destructive to the society. But if you're trying to stay alive, discriminate all you want. And you should. You should discriminate as hard as you need to to stay alive, but no harder. If you're discriminating, you know, just for entertainment or whatever, that'd be crazy. But for sure, if there's a group that has decided that your life is worthless, you should take that into consideration in your self-defense, keeping your family safe. All right, but don't discriminate against the individuals. Um, Have you noticed that uh, television is now unwatchable? So, obviously, you know that that Israel is doing their best to frame this situation to get support. You know, of course, that the Palestinians and the supporters of Hamas are framing the situation in a way to get the most support. What, What that means in the practical level is that if you turn on the TV somebody's going to be describing the vicious death of a baby or possibly a mother. I can listen to some of that because I I need to understand how dire the situation is. I can't listen to too much of it. So um, my new thing is that the moment the propaganda comes on, and by the way, when I call it propaganda, that's not an insult. It's also not a call to have less of it. In the context of war, the propaganda is also a weapon. And Israel is in an all-weapon war. So if they have a weapon they can use, use it. You know, they have the right of self-defense. 
And short of a nuclear or you know, maybe gas attack that's banned, all tools are on the table. And propaganda is just a tool. So when you watch the news, just be fully aware it's not news during this war. You know, all the news of this area is just propaganda. It's propaganda on the left, it's propaganda on the right, but none of it is really an attempt to tell you what's going on in some balanced way, because it's war. Now, that's why I told you early on, and I'll remind you, I'm not trying to be objective about the Israel-Gaza thing. I'm not even trying to be objective. I'm taking sides. And I'm taking sides because the October 7th thing was so beyond the pale of civilized behavior that it has to be addressed in the most aggressive way possible. Now, you might say, but Scott, what about the history of the region? I don't care. That's it. I don't care about the history of the region. Not at all. Not even a little bit. And you can't make me care. There's no story you can tell about the bad things that happened. Probably. Probably bad things happened. One side was worse than the other. Maybe. I don't care. I don't care if one side was worse. Maybe, maybe these people should have a right to return. So? I don't care. It's all history. And it's their history. It's not even my history. Don't fucking care what, used to di- what happened in the past. Don't care. You guys can care and kill each other over it, but I don't have to care. What I care about is what's happening today. And what happened today you know, this month, is something that civilization cannot, cannot let go unaddressed. And that's the only thing I care about. So when I say I'm backing Israel in their actions, that doesn't mean I back everything they do, you know, the way they do it, the specific way they do it. I'm just saying, in general, they have a full right to self-defense. Somebody says, I'm a puppet. I promise you that if Israel had done this attack on the Palestinians, I would be anti-Israel. I promise you. Do you not believe that? Do you you think I would have been okay if the Israelis had attacked the Gazans and ripped babies apart? And I'd be like, well, you know, they had a good reason. No, I would not. No, there are some things that don't even, they're not even in the realm of politics. I would consider what Hamas did and what they've done to their people as mass brain damage. So you have a, you have a population that are just brain damaged at this point. They, their brains are not compatible with modern civilization. That's brain damage. Because brain damage would be, you know, you can't function in the world as it exists, whereas other people can. They can't function in the world as it exists. That's brain damage. So I'm not in favor of the brain damage people. I'm in favor of the people who are functioning people who did not, um, well, they suffered a terrible thing, and I don't want to see that happen anywhere again. So there should be a, a maximum response. But... Um, as far as the question about you know the two-state solution and the uh, blah 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 about the Palestinians, it probably is terrible. The, they probably have some argument to make. You know what I think about their argument? There's nobody who had a better shot at success than Gaza. Do you know why? Because they had funding. They had a good location. And they had, if they had gone, you know, if they'd gone in any civilized direction, they would have the best trading partner in the world, in that part of the world, because they would have a you know, connection to Israel if they had decided to go that direction. And you know, you add the location and the the fact that they're right in a nice good economic area, they could have easily been um, you know, a paradise very easily. They chose a different way. Now, I do feel sympathy for the regular citizens who are not especially political, but you know, get dragged into it. But you know, <clears throat> I don't have a solution for that. 
All right, it is what it is. So don't watch the coverage. Um, yeah. If the coverage is just going to be more making you feel bad, just turn it off. Don't watch that shit. Um, the Hamas leadership. Now, here's one of those situations where there's, there's an obvious right answer, in my opinion. The Hamas leadership apparently is operating in the open, at least in Qatar. And here's how I think Israel should handle it. They should give the host country a reasonable deadline to turn the person over, um, just to be polite. But either way, they should make the host country completely understand that that person is going to be dead and by a certain date. You could put a date on it. You could just say, uh, after this date, if you've not handed him over to us, after this date, make sure you're not standing within a block of anywhere he is, because he's going to die. And then they would say, my God, that would be a war against Qatar if you did that, if you attacked him on our soil. And then Israel should say, yes, that's what it is. And then they should say, you will pay a huge price for this. And then Israel should say, give us the bill. Give us the bill. We'll pay it. But he's going to be dead. We we have to take away from you. uh, You have to reframe this. You want to reframe it away from a negotiation and into a how do you want him to die. If If they imagine they're negotiating, you're in the wrong frame. There's no negotiating. That guy's fucking dead. Israel is going to kill him with certainty. They need to make Qatar know that in this case, this is not normal business. This guy's going to die. There's going to be a lot of exploding wherever he is after this date. You do what you want, Qatar. Do whatever you want. Get whatever revenge you want. He's going to die in this date. You can either do it on your territory or ours. That's the only choice you have. That's how I'd play it. And I think just in general, um, the leaders need to have a little more skin in the game. All right. Um, There's a story about uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. A judge has decided that the election was uh, very rigged and the ballot boxes were stuffed. Uh, the, the exterior ballot boxes, what do you call them? The ballot drop-off places. Um, and they've got a video of people stuffing them, you know, obviously. And apparently it's just, it was just so rigged that the judge was just couldn't even believe it. Now, here's a question. Suppose, ooh, I don't know, suppose there had been no video on those drop boxes. Oh, we'll call them drop boxes. Thank you. Drop boxes. Suppose there had been no video and no witnesses. Would anybody know that the cheating happened? My understanding is that they were stealing ballots somehow and throwing away the ones they knew were against them and stuffing them with ones that, who knows. How, how much of what, was, what happened in this small race could have happened in any race and also gotten away with it. It's hard to imagine that the Democrats are still sitting there thinking, well, it must have been a fair election because the courts didn't catch anybody. Do you know how fucking dumb that is? There, There are some things that are opinions, and there are some things that are so fucking stupid that you just have to call it out as stupid. If you think the election was fair because nobody got caught, you're a fucking idiot. Now, if I said, I know the elections were rigged, I'd be a fucking idiot, right? Is that fair? If I said, I know they're rigged, because I don't. I mean, certainly, there are certainly indications. (laughs) There are suggestions. There are allegations, right? But... Personally, I've not seen something that, that convinces me somebody found something that would prove the elections were, were rigged. Proof. Because I think that no matter how much you suspect, 
no matter how much your anecdotal observations confirm it, you still need the goods. Right? We still live in a world where you've got to produce the goods. Maybe it'll happen someday. Who knows? But if you're, if you're confident that the election was fair because nobody went to jail for rigging it, you're a fucking idiot. How can you live in the United States and see that every institution is corrupt and just think that that one is the good one? I mean, you'd have to be super, super dumb to think that you know a national election is fair or not fair. Now, if they found proof it was rigged, then you you might have something that you could be sure about. But you don't have that. So being unsure is the correct logical place to be. But if you were unsure, but you had an opinion about the likelihood, then you'd also be in good shape. Uh, the likelihood is that every institution is corrupt. Those are the odds, right? The odds are any institution that's been around a while is corrupted by now because everything that can be corrupted gets corrupted eventually. There's no exception to that. If it can be corrupted, it'll get corrupted. All right. Um, remember the shooter, Robert Card, the uh, guy in Maine who killed a bunch of people? Um, we still don't know what pharmaceutical drugs he may have been on, if any. Do you think we'll ever know that? Do you think he'll ever tell us? Or do you think that Big Pharma is powerful enough to make sure that that's never in the news? I don't think it'll ever be in network news because they're all backed by Big Pharma. But it might, you know, may come out in some internet platform. All right. Uh, you all know uh, live streamer Sticks Hex and Hammer 666. Let's just call them Sticks. Um, he's saying that uh, YouTube is, you know, massively shadow banning him. And, yeah, he. And he's right. He's right, of course. And I realized that one of the biggest benefits of the X platform is it gives you a standard which you can compare to your other um, social media experiences. So in my case, my YouTube channel has stayed basically flat no matter what. All right, there'll be a few bumps like when I got canceled, but basically then it goes right back to same number. In fact... I can tell you the number of viewers today, 6,600. Right. I, I don't know the detail, but I will tell you the answer that when I turn it off, it'll be 6,600. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell the locals people if I got it right. And it's because the, the traffic doesn't seem to have any relationship to how well I'm doing or anything. It just seems like it's flatlined and it has for years. Likewise... My um, my Instagram traffic or followers, pretty much just constant. Hasn't changed in the longest time. But my X traffic, shoo, zooming up. My uh, number of subscribers, both on X and on the Locals platform, doubled since last year. Doubled. While those other things are flat. Do you think that's natural? <laughs> Do you think by Instagram, traffic is just completely natural? It just stays the same, no matter what? Uh, do you think my YouTube uh, traffic is just natural? So yesterday, I lost my monetization on Spotify. Looks like it might be a technical problem or some other kind of problem, but they just eliminated my monetization. So for podcasting... Now, how many times have I had my monetization taken away? Lots of times. It's always temporary. Right? It feels a lot like the Hamas strategy for trying to get Israel to leave. You, know, you just peck them to death with every little thing you can. That's what it feels like. I mean, it could be a bunch of coincidences. It would be, be a lot of coincidences, wouldn't it? Do you, do you think there are any left-leaning people who... Uh, got demonetized on Spotify. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is all I wanted to talk about today. 
I think I have changed your lives. Let's see if I missed any big stories. Um, I don't talk about Israel's attack on Gaza because I don't believe any of it. You okay with that? So there, there will be endless stories about what Israel did or did not do in Gaza. I don't believe any of them. I don't believe the positive ones. I don't believe they necessarily killed the, one of the planners. Not necessarily. You know, for example, if they accidentally bombed the wrong place, are they more likely to say, well, we're pretty sure there was a Hamas leader under there, or are they likely to say, oh, shoot, we killed a bunch of civilians we didn't mean to kill? Which would be more likely? Well, in war, information is a tool. So you would expect that both sides are shading the news to you know, support their narrative, and that there's nobody who knows what's happening who has an interest in telling you the truth. Would you agree on that? There's nobody who would have the information about what's really happening who also wants you to know it, or wants you to know the honest version. There's nobody like that. So I'm kind of ignoring the stories about, you know, Israel increased their attack, or they, they took out a leader, but some civilians died. I don't believe any of it. And I would recommend you don't believe any of it either, which is different from saying it's not true. Some of it's true. Some of it's half true. Some of it's completely true. Some of it's out of context. But there's nothing useful that you're going to learn by watching the news. <laughs> if Israel is doing its job right, and all indications are it's doing a good job for what it's trying to accomplish, they would be completely managing the information flow by now. They, they, they're probably turning off the power to make sure there aren't too many phones at work. They can't get information out on their own, and then they can control the, the information um, universe. So part of the war is controlling the minds and the news. And I'd say they're probably doing a good job of that. Probably doing a good job. I, somebody I saw Al Jazeera mentioned in the comments. Um, I think it was Peter Zayan who said that the best news source in general is Al, Al Jazeera, but on this specific conflict, it's the worst because <laughs> they're just you know, sort of on one team. So uh, Al Jazeera seems to be an asset when it's something that they don't care about but the moment they care about it, it becomes uh, useless, basically. Like all news sources. Um, Didn't we set that up? I don't think so. Scott has Gelman amnesia. About what? Uh, 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 I'm seeing... Is that one of those just generic insults because you don't have a, an opinion and your brain is broken? Glenn, figure it out, Glenn. You're not so dumb you can't figure out the left-right thing. Don't, don't act, uh, I love it when people act dumb to, as a gotcha. That, that, that's like the most annoying thing. Sometimes there's a gotcha that's there, like they can actually get you. But other times they'll act like they don't understand an easy point so they can get you. <laughs> so they're, Glenn here is pretending he doesn't understand a very simple concept so they can get me. Glenn, maybe it's just you not understanding something pretty simple. Maybe it's that. Uh, PJ says that I only believe the news I want to believe even when it's from the same source. PJ, are you deaf? Did you miss everything I just said in the last five minutes? All of it? The part about not believing anything from either side? You missed that completely, and your interpretation of don't believe anything from anybody, your interpretation is that I'm believing one side. I'm not even talking about it. I disbelieve it so much. I won't even report that somebody said it. I disbelieve it that much. But your take from it is, you just believe that one side. (laughs) 
That's what Gelman amnesia is? <laughs> Do you even know what it is? I think you like don't know what the concept is or something. Simplest way to solve the debt crisis, we should not pay it. <laughs> that would be the end of civilization. I don't know if somebody told you that the only, the only person who would suffer would be China if we stopped paying our debt. You, you, might, you might need to improve your news sources if that's what somebody told you. Scott, please reach out to RFK. That's old news. We've already communicated. He's already had a procedure. I, I saw a video of him on... So on Oliver Stone's uh, documentary about JFK, RFK is one of the you know, main uh, people he interviews. And if you listen to RFK Jr.'s voice from... It was probably, I don't know, a year or two ago, and you compare it to today, it's really different. So whatever procedure he had, it was different than the one I had. But he had a procedure that improved it at least 30 40%. I mean, it's quite noticeable. Do I like board games? No. Do you know why I don't like board games? They have board built right into them. Board. They spell it different, but differently, but I know what they mean. Uh, what's the announcement you mentioned early in the broadcast? Um, I think it was about the mugs. I think I already did it. RFK is for reparations. Yeah, that's sort of disqualifying. How is my voice now compared to... Well, I'll give you um, my impression of myself talking, you know, I might actually have a clip of it. I'll see if I can find the audio of it. Someplace I have it. But if I were to answer the phone call, uh, no, let's say if a, if a flight attendant asked me for what beverage I wanted, and I wanted a Diet Coke, uh, I couldn't say D. Um, D was the hard one. So I'd be like, I Coke. And they'd say, What? I, uh, I Coke, and they'd bring me a regular Coke. <laughs> it happened all the time, because I it doesn't sound enough like diet, so I got a lot of regular Cokes. Um, I'm glad I quit drinking soda, so that was old days. <laughs> so if I have Gelman amnesia, instead of yelling that over and over again, perhaps you could say in, in a simple form, what I don't remember. Go. So in the comments, tell me what I don't remember. You can't, right? You just learned a new term and you're yelling it at me, but there's no examples of it. So you just went quiet. As soon as I asked you to tell me what I got wrong, you just completely went quiet. Uh, the, the most worthless people are the people who call other people narcissists. Uh, you're really worthless. You, you should do something about that. Um, all right, well, you, I guess you gave up on that Gelman amnesia thing, didn't you? All right, good. I just want to make sure that was just a troll. I thought maybe there was something I... I'm worthy of being criticized for, but it wasn't that. All right. Um, <laughs> narcolepsy, not narcissist. When you say at all at the end of a sentence, you completely trail off. Uh, What? Boy, there's, there's some broken people over here today. All right, that's enough YouTube. <clears throat> I gave you your chance. But uh, thanks for joining. When I sign off, I'm going to look at the number of people who joined. I'll bet it's 6,600. 
I'll talk to you tomorrow.